Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good. Welcome to the opening session of the 33rd International Churchill Conference. My name is David Freeman. Many of you know me already as the editor of Finest Hour, but I'm here this weekend acting in my capacity as ch program chair for this conference. We want to make a special welcome to the C-SPAN audience, which will be watching us live for all the panel sessions today and tomorrow. So we're sticking to a rigid timetable. We're going to get right into it by introducing our first speaker of the morning, the executive director of the International Churchill Society, Mr. Lee Pollock. Thank you, David, and I join you in welcoming everyone who's here today to what will be a wonderful conference. Or as one of our presidential candidates might say, this crowd is huge. <laughs> it, it's been a year since our last and very memorable conference in Oxfordshire, and in my case, six years since I became your executive director. During the past year, with your support, we've continued to build on the work that has gone before. Just consider a couple of things. Do a Google search for Winston Churchill, you'll find 36 million results. We're number three. It's hard to beat Wikipedia, but we'll keep on trying and we'll be more accurate. <laughs> We've continued our series of events on Capitol Hill, building on one of our proudest moments, the dedication of the bust of Churchill three years ago in the Capitol. We've expanded our programs from events with young professionals at the British Embassy to seminars at the Aspen Institute and the National World War I and II Museums. And we've enhanced our partnerships with organizations such as the Royal Oak Foundation and the ESU. And we've reached out to prominent audiences, such as our dinner last year with Madeleine Albright and tonight at the State Department with James Baker. When I became executive director, Lawrence asked me to look into another idea, a permanent home for Churchill Studies in Washington, D.C. I didn't know much about that, but I found a brochure in our files. It began with, we stand on the brink of a new century, quite a while ago. In a moment, Lawrence will tell you what happened next. One of the great pleasures of being your executive director has been the opportunity to learn more about the life of Winston Churchill. And so much of that knowledge has come from you. It has also allowed me to develop deep and cherished friendships. To me, the Center's overriding purpose is to ensure that today's young people believe in three things. First, that history matters. Second, that leadership is meaningful and that our destiny is not beyond our control. And third, that especially in challenging times, one person makes a difference in the world. Winston Churchill is surely a good example of that. At the end of this month, I'll be stepping down as the Center's full-time executive director. As Lawrence will tell you, I'll be succeeded by a very talented individual, and I couldn't be more pleased about the chosen candidate. I'm also delighted that I'll remain on the Board of Trustees and as an advisor, and vigor vigorously support all of the International Churchill Society's activities. I'll continue speaking and writing about Churchill when the opportunity arises, and if it's a slow news day, perhaps I can get the Wall Street Journal to let me write another op-ed. You all know the story when Churchill was once asked about retiring, his response was, I leave when the pub closes. But the metaphorical Churchill pub always remains open as long as, in the words of President Kennedy, courage and faith and the zest for freedom are indestructible. So you'll find me in that Churchill pub, perhaps with a Johnny Walker in hand. Come say hello and I'll bet we'll have a great conversation for there is nothing more fun than being a Churchillian in the company of other Churchillians. And now I'll turn over the mic to our, my friend and our chairman, Lawrence Geller. Good morning. Writing in his memoirs, Churchill observed of the American people that their national psychology is such that the bigger the idea, the more wholeheartedly 
and obstinately do they throw themselves into making it a success. Nearly 50 years ago, a small group of enthusiasts came together to compare notes on postage stamps bearing Churchill's likeness. Only a few months before he died, Sir Winston's son Randolph gave his blessing to this newly formed organization. Thus, the International Churchill Society was born. Today, as we gather for our 33rd international conference, we count more than 3,000 members and two dozen, over two dozen chapters worldwide. Our journal, Finest Hour, has been published continuously since 1981. We've hosted royalty, leading politicians, journalists, authors, captains of industry, and renowned scholars, many of whom have not only spoken at our events, but also contributed to our journals. Above all, we earned our reputation as the go-to organization for anyone, be it idle amateur or famed academic, anyone with an interest in the life and legacy of Churchill. Our website is vi visited by more than one and a half million people annually, and we're bringing other Churchill websites into our fold as we work towards our goal of at least four million sessions annually. And while our online monthly, the Chartwell Bulletin, has today more than 30,000 subscribers, our ambitious target of 100,000 subscribers is well within our reach. Daily, we connect with thousands more through our continuously strengthening social media platforms. Even more importantly, we've made it possible for high school students around the world to have free access to the Churchill archives online and to use the related and constantly updated bespoke learning modules. Already some 1,000 schools have signed up in the US, UK, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. And we're only just beginning. We have our next step of 5,000 schools as our goal. Concurrently, we continue to promote the teaching of Churchill's legacy in schools, both through locally organized seminars free to teachers and students, and by making attendance at our conferences free to these same eager minds. We have improved as an institution. We have professional staff. We're able to pay for quality contributions to our journals and our conferences. Our milestone merger with the American Fund for the Churchill Museum at the Cabinet War Rooms in London solidified this growing professional identity, broadened our base, and firmed up our finances. In 2013, we donated a bust of Sir Winston for permanent displays in the, hall, in the halls of the United States Capitol building and organized an unveiling ceremony at which the Secretary of State and all four congressional leaders, Republicans and Democrats in a bipartisan effort, publicly affirmed their admiration for who, the man who was clearly the most important person of the 20th century. Yet despite these achievements, these many achievements, we were at a disadvantage. The UK is blessed with a plethora of physical assets that help to keep the memory of Churchill alive. The Churchill War Rooms and Museum in the heart of London, Chartwell, Blenheim, Bletchley, the archives at Churchill College, Cambridge. All of these splendid facilities protect Churchill's legacy in the UK for each new generation to discover. However, within the US, the only physical asset is the National Churchill Museum located on the campus of Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri, the site of Churchill's 1946 Iron Curtain speech. This museum was part of a separate organization and needed much more support to expand its reach and attract more visitors. We knew that without a significant platform here in Washington, to educate succeeding generations and inject the lessons of Churchill's example into the mightiest corridors of power, interest in Churchill would wane. Aging would take its inevitable toll on us, 
and we'd simply fade into unpalatable obscurity, our duty to Churchill unfulfilled. So in the depth of the global economic crisis that began in 2008, I developed a plan for the future to be accomplished by 2015, the 50th anniversary of Churchill's death. I presented this rather overambitious but much needed plan to our patron, the wonderful and wise Mary Soames, and to her nephew, the always uplifting Winston Churchill's namesake grandson, whose belief in the need for a permanent home in Washington to preserve his grandfather's legacy never wavered for one moment. Both gave complete and unconditional support, pragmatic advice, and endless encouragement, although I privately thought they believed I was barking mad. Their deaths, Winston in 2010 and Mary in 2014, were devastating blows. And it made it clear that time was not on our side. Early last year, we endured endured yet another heavy loss, with the death of the Dean of all Churchill Scholars, Sir Martin Gilbert, a passionate supporter of this bold plan, which he called our lifeblood. As Churchillians, we know that inspiration can always be found in the words of our hero, never give in, never give in, never, never, never. I'll admit, however, that those three deaths, those three deaths the economic downturns which affected our financial situation and the daunting challenge we'd set ourselves meant there were times when I had to fight mightily to keep Churchill's infamous black dog at bay. But to use another Churchillian expression, I KBO'd, I kept buggering on. Other members of the Churchill family provided their own support, help and encouragement. The always uplifting Celia Sands and her sister, that wonderful artist, Edwina Sands, and of course the irrepressible and continuously generous Randolph Churchill. We'll never be able to repay the debt of gratitude we owe and will owe to that incredibly hardworking and supportive Churchill family who, despite having their own busy lives and large families, always graciously give so much of themselves to our organization. It's a testament to what we're achieving today that so many more hardworking family members are committed to our cause, including Mary Soames' eldest son, Sir Nicholas Soames, MP, and Randolph's three siblings, Jenny, Marina, and Jack, all three of whom have accepted roles within this, our new organization. And so we push forward, and at last now we can see the sunlit uplands. We've in fact achieved much more than that original plan envisioned. We've made it more certain than ever that the legacy of Churchill will continue to be widely known and appreciated throughout the world. Now, thanks also to the hard work, creativity, and persistence of both Jean-Paul Montupé and Dr. Benjamin Akande, as well as the support of Edwina Sands and those two wonderful Churchillians, Munro Trout and Dick Mahoney, we're at last, at long last, rightfully merging with the National Churchill Museum of the United States at Westminster College. Our combined strengths are truly the classic case of two plus two equaling at least six. We've come a long way, and we've reached an important milestone. To mark this time of change, we're making some name changes as well. From this moment, we shall once again be known as the International Churchill Society. <clears throat> to increase our name identification with non-members, the Chartwell Bulletin will be renamed the Churchill Bulletin beginning with the next issue. We have a new logo, emblematic of a fresh tomorrow. And tomorrow, after decades of wishful thinking, we will officially open our National Churchill Library and Center on the campus of the globally respected George Washington University.
This long-awaited event couldn't have happened without the support of two successive GW presidents, who are both great friends of ICS. First, the inspiring Stephen Trachtenberg, and then particularly Steve Knapp, whose wisdom, endless patience with me, perseverance and spirit will make him forever a much revered Churchillian. ICS will both intellectually and financially support, advise and coordinate the work of two US Churchill institutions, the National Churchill Library and Center and the National Churchill Museum. It will ensure that these two sister institutions not only cooperate as allies, but promote the men memory of Winston Churchill in North America. Importantly, they will flourish together far better than each could do on their own. ICS will also be based at this newly purpose-built facility, the NCLC, to introduce a new acronym in, in a city full of alphabet acronyms. There we will welcome write readers, writers, researchers, <coughs> scholars, and the just plain curious to explore the life and legacy of Churchill using a growing and unique archive of documents, books, and electronic media. The collection will expand. Exhibitions and high-profile events will be organized. From here, our flourishing journals will continue to be published. The NCLC will make meaningful and original contributions to Churchill studies. Symposia and lectures and debates will always be happening. Links to our sister institutions in Britain and Fulton will provide amazing opportunities for sharing exhibitions and events. In short, NCLC will be the epicenter for all Churchill-related activities in the United States. Finally, Churchillians throughout North America will have their permanent home. Not only one link to the historical venue of Fulton, but situated here in the very heart of the most important of the world's capitals. This new home, our home, adjacent to Foggy Bottom State Department, is only a few minutes walk from the White House, where, I am happy to say, a much admired bust of Churchill continues to stand, as it has now for the last 50 years, in the private quarters of the First Family. Now, this is not the end. It's not even the beginning of the end. But it is perhaps, after nearly a 50 year start, the end of the beginning. At long last, we now have the tools to do the job and must look to the future. Our plan sets out one of those big ideas that Churchill understood could completely captivate the minds of the American people and bring out their creative and energetic powers. Here in Washington, we're surrounded by venerables and venerated institutions of study, including, for example, only the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, the Brookings Institution, the Heritage Foundation, and the American Enterprise Institute. We are dedicated and passionate in our commitment that within five years, the NCLC will stand tall among these institutions and be globally recognized and respected as a, as a facility that supports and encourages research, discussion, and new thinking in methods of leadership, global citizenry, statesmanship, and resolution of conflict. With the example of the last century's supreme statesman as our guide, the fellows of NCLC will have a growing and influential impact in these fields. Policymakers will come to NCLC for guidance and advice, and we'll promote healthy exchange of ideas through our forums, and even hosting, within eight years, presidential debates. As we've seen again and again in the many crises that have beset our still young century, in times of trouble, people rightly look to the example of Winston Churchill. 
Now we have a strong cadre of leadership from a new generation of Churchillians, led by Randolph Churchill, who I'm delighted to announce has finally today accepted the role of president of ICS. It was not an easy task to get him to say yes, but he's the only one we want. This cadre of young leaders, known simply as the Other Club, are pushing us forward with fresh energy, dynamism and vitality. They make us financially, intellectually and generationally self-sustaining. And I stand in bewildered awe of all that they do will do and will bring to our organization. Fundraising, that dirty word, is a permanent fact of life in growth organizations such as ours. And although we've raised millions thus far from many generous and supportive donors, we constantly need to be reaching further afield for more funds to support both specific and general programs. Your help, connections, Ideas, and yes, of course, your donations are always much needed and truly appreciated. Now you may ask, what are our aims? They are, of course, victory. Victory at all costs. And this is what our victory will look like. We will establish the NCLC and ICS as the authority on the life lessons legacy and relevancy of Winston Churchill. We will make the NCLC and the ICS the place to go for research into leadership, statesmanship, strategy, resolution of conflict, national and international purpose, and the protection of democracy and freedom. And finally, we will carry out the mandate given to us by Churchill's daughter all those years ago, our late patron, and that the memory of Sir Winston Churchill would be kept green and the record of his achievements accurate. I know I should end with an appropriate Churchill quote. However, I want to share with you the last lines from the Robert Frost poem that has always reminded me not only of the importance of our task, but what still lies ahead in our grand adventure. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep, and miles to go before I sleep, and miles to go before I sleep. Thank you very much. If I'm tearing up, you'll forgive me, because I just was thinking of Mary Winston and Martin Gilbert just now, and how I wish they would have been here. <coughs> Forgive me. Before I relinquish the podium, I want to thank Lee Pollock, who's been my hard-working partner. He's been patient with my moods, uh, my noise, uh, my crises, and has never been overwhelmed. He was a partner in this crusade for these last half a dozen years, and together we weathered the storms that threatened us all. He has the gratitude and appreciation of us all. He and his wonderful, ever forbearing wife, Jill, have decided it's time to retire from the daily toil in the Churchill vineyards and my outbursts. And they're worth staying in touch, as you heard, as an active advisor and member of the board. More importantly, Lee has developed a following and is a much sought after speaker on Churchill and I hope he continues that. Lee is passing the torch to another member of the other club. After a long and thorough search, GW and ourselves selected from a wide field of wonderful candidates, a man who ticks all the boxes and has taken on the dual challenge of serving both as the first director of the National Churchill Library and Center and succeeding Lee as Executive Director of ICS. Michael Bishop is a longtime member of the Churchill Center, now ICS, and comes to us from Strategic Investment Group. 
It's an asset management company in Arlington, Virginia, where he has served or had served as chief of communications. A California native, Michael was educated at the University of California at Berkeley, GW itself, and Georgetown University. He ex has extensive political experience, having served on Capitol Hill during the Clinton years and later in the White House during the administration of G.W. Bush. He was also executive director of the Abraham Lincoln Bicentennial Commission and served as a consultant for the Steven Spielberg film about the 16th president. His re reviews and articles on Churchill, the Great War, Lincoln and other subjects regularly appear in the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post and the National Review and elsewhere. Michael, will you come up and introduce yourself to a truly magnificent and daunting audience of Churchillians all of whom I know join me in wishing you every success as together we all continue our grand adventure into a bright and exciting future. Thank you, Lawrence, very much for that kind introduction. All of us owe you an enormous debt of gratitude for your leadership and your indefatigable efforts to keep the Churchill flame alive. May we have another round of applause for our distinguished chairman, please. Thank you. And thanks to Lee Pollack for helping to make this moment a reality. He has done Churchill's legacy a great service, and I'm pleased to call him a friend. Thank you, Lee. It is a tremendous honor to be appointed the first director of the National Churchill Library and Center at the George Washington University and executive director of the International Churchill Society. I'm grateful to the board of ICS and the leadership of the GW Libraries for selecting me. Though I've only been in my post since Monday, my new colleagues at the university have already made me feel at home. And as a 1994 recipient of a master's degree in history from GW, for me, it is a sort of homecoming. Soon, you will see for yourselves the fruits of our efforts. After years of toil and struggle, the NCLC is a reality. Within that sleek, silvery space, students and visitors will have access to hundreds of volumes on Churchill, from classic works to much of the most recent scholarship. An interactive, touchscreen video exhibition will allow patrons to see in colorful and vivid detail countless photographs and documents that bring the great man to life. And the incomparable holdings of the Churchill Archive Center, Churchill College, Cambridge, will be available to visitors online. Thanks to a generous gift from the ICS, the NCLC can also boast a remarkable collection of Churchill's Second World War engagement diary cards, never before available to the public or to scholars. In addition, and by the way, these cards form a fascinating contemporary record of the Prime Minister's meetings and movements during the Second World War. In addition to the originals, high-resolution digital scans are available online, and a remarkably successful crowdsourcing project has yielded detailed transcriptions. And I'm pleased to announce that you can read more about this historical treasure trove and the NCLC in the Washington Post today. But the value of the NCLC is not to be found in books, papers, or pixels alone. The walls of the library will soon ring with the sounds of discussion and debate. As we host lectures by prominent historians, political figures, business people, and others, and explore the countless issues that touch upon the Churchill story. Among them, questions of war and peace, the future of the European Union, and the continuing challenges in the Middle East. To study the life and career of Winston Churchill is in many ways a welcome respite from a seemingly tawdry and ignoble present. But Churchill studies are no mere exercise 
in nostalgia, but rather a blueprint for leadership. Indeed, leadership will be chief among the themes we will explore at the NCLC. As the great man's example provides inspiration and instruction to leaders and aspiring leaders in many different fields of endeavor. In all of this, I look forward to working in concert with my new colleagues at the marvelous National Churchill Museum at Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri, especially the chairman, Jean-Paul Montepé, and the director, Tim Riley. We are met at the end of the ugliest, most dispiriting presidential campaign of modern times, or perhaps of any time. I would like to close with words of Sir Winston that may act as a soothing balm and serve as a preview of what you will see at the NCLC tomorrow. In 1947, Churchill said, all the greatest things are simple and many can be expressed in a single word, freedom, justice, honor, duty, mercy, hope. Thanks for all you have done to preserve the legacy of Winston Churchill. I trust we can count on your support in the future and that together we may move forward into broad, sunlit uplands. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to have a very quick turnaround and go immediately into our first panel. So I'll invite the uh, panelists up, and I will be turning over the microphone to uh, Professor Dane Kennedy of George Washington University, who will be the moderator for our panel on Churchill and the Presidents.